I'd love it if you could humor me for just one minute. I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourself in a place that frightens you. Maybe you find yourself in a dark room or on the tallest skyscraper imaginable. Maybe you're on stage giving a TED talk in front of hundreds of strangers whose eyes are piercing at you, just waiting for you to mess up so that they can post it on social media where it goes viral. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Maybe that's just my fear. But now, I want you to imagine that you're joined by someone else. And this person, while you don't know exactly who they are, they do seem vaguely familiar. And they tell you, don't worry, it's OK. I know that you're in a scary situation, but trust me, because I've been in your shoes before, and I'm here to guide you out. Suddenly, that space doesn't seem so frightening. That familiar face becomes an instant source of trust. And when your body's natural fight or flight response to fear kicks in, that voice not only encourages you to fight, but it lets you know that you won't be fighting alone. I wish that I could let you know that I knew all of this to be true based on my personal experiences. But unfortunately, that's not my story. Because when I was getting ready to become queen of the hill as a fifth grader in my elementary school, my dad apparently was also becoming a king of the hill on his job. Growing up in Lake Charles, Louisiana, there were three main industries, the oil refineries, the casino boats, and agriculture. My dad worked at the oil refineries and had just gotten promoted to shift supervisor. So while he was preparing to move on up in his job, he also was getting ready to move us on out of the hood. Dad had always imagined that we would experience a better life than he had growing up, and that we'd have access to opportunities that he never did. For him, this meant building a huge six-bedroom home for our eight-member family, leaving the inner cities of Lake Charles and moving into a mostly white suburban neighborhood right along the outskirts. For me, this meant existing in an unfamiliar territory for the first time in my life. So when I close my eyes and I think back to a situation that frightens me, I'm taken back to middle and high school. And it's not just because I was in a new environment. It's also not because of your typical new kid on the block experiencing hormones, dealing with popularity contests or the SATs. It's because I was fighting with feelings of doubt, loneliness, insecurities, and fear and I felt like I had to fight through these feelings all by myself. There were not many people who looked like me at my new school. I couldn't find anyone who could identify with my struggle, who could let me know, it's okay. I know you're afraid, but I've been in your shoes and I'm here to guide you out. So during my adolescent years, as I was beginning to form beliefs about myself and make decisions about my future, I kept getting tripped up over this constant question of why. Why am I the only black girl in my physics class on the dance team, in the student government, or on prom court? Why are none of my teachers black? Why does it suddenly see, feel so awkward to study American history or celebrate Black History Month? And why do we have to leave the black community in order to have a better chance at success? Not only was I dealing with these unanswered questions, but I was also forced to navigate this new and scary environment through the lens and perspectives of people who likely knew nothing about what it was like to be me. And they probably didn't really even see me at all. After years of growing weary through battling through this question, when it finally became time for me to decide what I wanted to do for college, I couldn't think about what city the school was in or what major I wanted to declare. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the cost of tuition or the credibility of an institution. My main concern was my deep, deep desire to finally escape to a place where I could feel seen and be safe. So I only applied to HBCUs. I landed at Prairie View A&M University right outside of Houston, Texas. Go Panthers. And I majored in computer engineering. This was the best decision that I could have made for myself during that time. Because for four years, I could focus more on my future and less on my fear. 
While college was an amazing time, it was also short-lived. Because upon graduating with an engineering degree and getting a job, I then became a black woman in tech. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, which was another new city, and began working for one of the world's largest technology consulting firms. This time was meant to be exciting and a major milestone of success. But I was unfortunately met again with those feelings of doubt, fear, loneliness, and confusion. Confusion about who I was and my place in this world. This time was meant to be exciting and a major milestone of success. But I was met again with these feelings of loneliness, doubt, fear, and confusion. Confusion about who I was and the place that I held in this world. These once familiar feelings that I tried to put aside began to rise up within me again. And they brought back that question of why. Why am I the only black woman on all of my tech teams? Why don't I see any women in leadership? And why, when I decide to have a conversation with my white male manager, does he feel it's okay to tell me, maybe you're being too idealistic? After seven years of fighting that battle, I decided I did not want to fight anymore. And so I quit. I became yet another statistic of a black woman who leaves her hard-earned and well-deserved tech career prematurely due to lack of support, lack of community, and lack of representation. And while I'm not always proud of my decision to quit, I do share my story proudly. I share it for those who need to know that their feelings and their experiences are valid and that they are not alone. Because somewhere out there is a young black woman who is excited about trying to make decisions about her future while simultaneously confused about her place in this world. Because to be a black woman in America who desires any level of success likely means that you're living in a perpetual state of confusion, fear, and striving. We start as little girls, as we're trying to achieve the acceptance and prove our worth to our peers and school teachers. And we continue as young women, trying to climb the impossible ladder of success with steps that might include moving with your family to the suburbs, striving to get acceptance into the well-known Ivy League college. And if you dare to become a black woman in tech who wants to take up space and be celebrated, then you go and work for a well-known company like Google. Now, I don't wanna have to be the one to tell you what it's like to be a black woman in tech who works for Google, but I'm sure that you can Google it. It isn't always obvious, but I hope that you're beginning to see what it's like to be the one, to be the only, to be the first, to live in constant displacement, transitioning from one scary environment to the next. And I wish that I could refer back to your body's natural fight or flight response to fear, but for many black women, it's not as simple as a question of fight or flight, but it is a question. How much fight do I actually have left before I am finally forced to flee? So, how do we solve for this problem? When dealing with systemic issues that impact our entire society, we can't just focus on workforce development or putting a DEI Band-Aid on corporate America. If we really want to solve a systemic problem, it makes sense to start at the root rather than pacifying the symptoms alone. For this, it means giving girls role models who look like them while they are in grade school. It means being honest about the ways that our systems and institutions have failed us. It means connecting young black girls to communities and role models who represent them and their experiences. As I began peeling back the layers of my childhood and really understanding the things that I was missing growing up, I also began to understand that black women mentors and role models do exist. They're just not dropping out of thin air and they're not being connected to the people who need them most. So I made it my personal mission and commitment to little Christina and other little girls who look like me that I would be instrumental 
to making those connections. I decided to get back in the fight and try to change the system for good. So in 2017, I started a nonprofit organization called HYPE. HYPE empowers black and brown girls with technology skills so that they can thrive as future leaders in 21st century careers. But HYPE is also more than that. HYPE is a community of young girls who learn and grow together, celebrate one another, and receive mentorship from women who speak to them with a conviction that can only come from personal experiences. This conviction, this intention, this representation are the reasons why HYPE scholars are not only becoming amazing technologists, they are also becoming positive agents of change in their families, their communities, and in the world because of the confidence that they're gaining and because of the commitment that they have to servant leadership. I started HYPE because I understand the role that community and connection plays to our social and emotional development. I understand the role that representation plays in a little girl's world who's trying to decide what she believes to be true. I understand the role that representation plays in the decisions that we make about our future. And I understand the role that it plays in gaining the confidence needed to fight those feelings of fear whenever they arise. So we give our girls representation. We connect them to brilliant black women who are doing amazing things in their jobs and on their communities through a vehicle of tech. And we've been doing this for hundreds of girls so far with the goal to do it for thousands more. But if that's gonna happen, we can't have young black women following in my previous footsteps and leaving their tech careers prematurely. We have to encourage them to stay the course, fight the fight and never give up. We do this by normalizing celebrating black women in tech, by acknowledging their struggle and the invaluable contributions that they've made to the industry. We do this by connecting them to a greater purpose, which are these young girls who are depending on them for representation and rooting on their success. We also do this by understanding that when it's time to have a conversation about underrepresentation in any arena, that we can't place the burden solely on the shoulders of black women alone. This is something that we must do together. This means more inclusive hiring practices and techniques. It means providing funding and scholarships for young black people, as well as the organizations and communities that support them. It means diverse recruitment efforts across colleges and universities around the world. And it means learning how to create culturally relevant spaces that replace fear with trust for the young black girls who are under our tutelage. Not only that, but if you are not someone who's underrepresented, it means becoming an ally who's not afraid of stepping aside and inviting someone else into your space of influence or authority so that they can more efficiently and quickly support the lives and dreams of the black girls who you serve. We have to recognize that representation is not only a nice to have, but a necessity. When we are intentional about inclusivity and cultural relevancy for the young people who are learning and growing based on how we educate them, we finally bring voice and validation to the fears that they might be feeling. Fears that historically underrepresented people have felt for a very long time. Not only that, but we give them the confidence that they need to respond to this fear with the fight that doesn't give up, and a hope to know that they're not only fighting for themselves, but fighting for others who might fo follow in their footsteps. And if we do this long enough, we have a chance at solving this problem for good and accomplishing Hype's mission to empower an entire generation who lives their lives full of hope, driven by love, and void of fear. Thank you. <laughs>